Beji beji fui afo Meki tire wikondoroja Beji beji fui grawang Meki tire wikondoroja We are here to honor those that went before us. We are here because we have a very important elder amongst us. So we are in this institution where we are dedicated to development studies and we're really good about analyzing and theorizing. But what I want to challenge you with today is to go a little bit beyond analysis. Don't just sit here so you can write a good paper because it is very special the fact that you have somebody here who's going to share his story and really what that was like. This person is like a walking encyclopedia <laughs> in terms of knowledge, in terms of experiences. I come from a culture where they say, if you want to know, you go sit at the feet of your elders. They don't say go read a book, but they say go sit at the feet of your elders. So today we are sitting at the feet of a very important elder. All right? So I want you to do, you know, again, you can have your intellectual mind, but I need you to open your heart and get ready to receive. And when you open up, you get ready to receive, something will be shaken up. You know, you might, you know, leave here a little bit like this, and that's all right, because we got each other. You know, but it is an honor, and it is a privilege, and it is special, the fact that we get to sit at the feet of this elder and to hear his story. And without further ado, Mr. Bob Brown. We, first of all, want to do some thanks. We want to thank Mavis for inviting us here to the Netherlands the second time. We're working on a slave trade project. We don't have time to talk about that this evening. There are several other venues over the next few days where we'll deal with that coldly and try to advance that whole struggle forward. We're happy to see Burl. We've seen each other all over the world at all kinds of meetings, and we won't give that lecture tonight about some of those meetings and situations that we found ourselves in. So we're extremely happy to see you here. And our brother, who we know through people in London, we're happy that Mavis introduced us to Erasmus University. We never heard of it, nor of him. <laughs> That's a fortunate part of our slavery situation. You can't imagine how many papers and books we've scanned. Sometimes we got electronics to read for us. For example, since I've been here, I've been sent 42 scholarly papers on the Panther Party. I'll scan them, I'll save them. I have more than 10,000 electronic books, PDF files, HTM on the Panther Party. Because I believe, as Kwame Nkrumah said, thought without action is empty, and action without thought is blind. Even if you don't know what you were doing when you did it, you need to study afterwards to figure out what you should have done differently or done better. You don't just tell the youth what you did, you tell or what you wanted to do, you tell them how you did it, why you did it, and why you were not capable or able to do some of the things you wanted to do so that they can learn from whatever they want and move forward. We're very happy to be here at Erasmus. We've Googled y'all like y'all ain't never been Googled before. <laughs> and we certainly Googled Erasmus. We unfortunately cannot read Dutch, so we are not able to read some of his letters and correspondence with Martin Luther. And the whole history of the Dutch Reformed Church and the Dutch Reformed Church's relationship to slavery. So we don't want to give that because we're limited in time. Let's get it on. Be clear, I'm an ex-Panther. I co-founded the party in Chicago because Kwame 
to Ray Stokely Carmichael asked me to. So there were disagreements from the moment I started. I only lasted 11 months, so let's not exaggerate. Time is very important. The Panther Party office was open November 1, 1968. He was murdered at 4.30 a.m. in the morning on December 4, 1969. Of that 13 months, he spent at least two or three months in prison. So just understand the time and the space and how fast things were moving. And just understand we were 20 years old. We were 20 years old. We didn't know what we were doing. We did the best we could. We have a problem with the Panther industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Marvel Comics and Walt Disney grossed $1.3 billion on a police flick. The superhero and supervillain were both policemen. So it perpetuates this image that the police, the movement was built and led by informants, by police. It's a genre of movies. We can't go into that. Academia, the, the panther narrative and the panther discourse within academia at least need to interview some of the other forces, not just the ones they keep interviewing. You at least need to get a different perspective on what happened and didn't happen. We come to give you a sampling of our perspective. We only have 30 minutes. You got to stop watch. Stop me, because I'll go for 17 hours nonstop and cuss you out every 15 minutes. So discipline me, stop me, keep me within time. We tried to put together a PowerPoint program. You don't know how we've been struggling with that. We haven't really even finished it yet, but at least you can see some images of some people you've never seen before. We can try to make some of the main points. At any point, you can stop. When the time is up, just say time is up, shut up, and I'll stop on the dime. What we want is dialogue and discussion and even confrontation. Yes, this program is being live streamed. The information was sent to me and I didn't see it because I'm overloaded with emails and we weren't able to put the information to the connection to the live stream. But once the program is over, over the next few days, we will live stream it like you have never seen before. Not just live stream it, broadcast it as far as we can so that youth in other corners of the world can see y'all and academicians can see y'all. They can see the quality and the quality of the discourse and we can maybe reignite an intellectual struggle, a cultural struggle, an organizational struggle around this and more important issues than the Panther Party. I spent 11 months in the Panther Party. I spent 30 years since then. And we don't have time to talk about those 30 years. Now, I guess I've taken up half my time. The Black Panther is still coming. Two three, four, five, two, three, four, five kids at a time. So that's not the only Black Panther. But that's the Black Panther. And everybody else is secondary, third, whatever. Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture. This is a press conference in New York City, May 23rd, 1966, announcing that the Black Panther Party is moving from Alabama in the South to take every city and village in the United States to build an all-independent black political party. The brother who's doing the interview was a journalist at that point in time in 1966. By 1972, he was the head of the blacks for the re-election of Richard J. Nixon in 72, 
He coordinated the black get out the vote Republican for the whole New England Northeast. He was a journalist at that point when he took that interview. But I just want to show you the complexity, good and bad, of the movement over there. We know each other. Different sides of the barricade. The slogan in the back, the Black Panther is coming, was the slogan to announce at the press conference the nationwide tour to recruit Black Panther Party chapters in every city that he went through. He's deceased, 21 years, but the Black Panther is still coming. Even if no other way except Marvel Comics and Walt Disney, they just made $1.3 billion off of the Black Panther, so it's still coming. In the middle of history wars, a war over the history of the Black Panther Party, the true history, the fake history. This is a war intellectually, not just a physical war of blood and, and, and guns and bullets. This is also an intellectual war. You claim to be intellectual. Well, at least you're here paying to become one. So let's analyze, let's argue intellectual concepts about what the Black Panther Party was supposed to be, what it wound up being. Understand up front, I did not come here to talk about grits and margarine and feeding children. I did not come here to talk about guns and bullets. That's what they got caught up in. That's why I left. I came to talk about the problems of our people and how we organize ourselves to solve those problems, and food for children is just one of our problems. Don't reduce it or elevate it to all of our problems. I'm an ex-Panther, and the problems I had with the Panther Party 50 years ago, I still got today. If I had a had time, Bobby Seale would be on live stream and Kathleen Cleaver would be on live stream. I would have personally invited all of them to let's have this conversation once again, because this is not the first time. There's a professor up in North Umbria University, Joe Street. He says that the Panther history has reached its golden age. You have thousands of, of articles and movies and books. It has reached its golden age, but as the history of the Panther Party or the Panther Movement is contested space. The history has not been resolved, not been properly written. It is contested. We enter that contest. We enter that war. We come with our perspective, with our facts, with our experience. We've been deliberately quiet for 50 years. We will not be quiet anymore. We will not be quiet anymore. And we will respect no one's position more than they respect ours, period. It's a war that we are waging. Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Secretary of Guinea, says history properly interpreted can be a map to where we have to go. And, and an indication of where we come from. That's not the exact quotes. A guide to the future, a map of the tragedy, the growing tragedy. We place great emphasis on the correct interpretation of history. Properly interpreted, it can be a weapon that can move us forward. Unproperly interpreted, it becomes a weapon to use to continue to exploit and to oppress us. We do not pretend to have a definitive history. You cannot arrest the dialectic of thought. You cannot arrest the dialectic of society. You therefore cannot arrest the dialectic of history or the dialectic of revolution. It changes. It changes as new generations come, as new information is discovered. But the change has to be progressive not a change that pushes us further backwards. We come to help make our contribution. A panther is a cat. 
We talk about the Panther Party. Let's talk about the cat. You know, there is no such animal in the zoological universe. No distinct species called a panther. A panther is a jaguar, a cougar with excessive melanin. <laughs> you see the cat with the kittens, all colors. And then you see the little black one. I don't want to do my Francis Crest wealth speech. I'm sure y'all have not heard of it. The melanin theory of confrontation. Anyway, long story. Panther is a cat with excessive melanin. For whatever reasons, it comes out a little darker, a little browner, a little well done. But it is still part of that family, that network. Cats do not have kittens one at a time. They have two or more kittens for each litter, and the litters are two years or more during the childbearing phase. We will talk about the origins of the Panther Party. We will talk about seven litters, or at least five tonight. We will only talk about June 10, 1964, when it was conceived, well thought out, well planned, and well sabotaged. And we will stop July 4, 1969, when the Panther resigned after we ordered him to. <laughs> you told me to build a party in Chicago. I did it. I wasn't the only one. We were pushed out, purged, or walked out, and we sent him resignation July 4, 1969. Mary McCable rolled into JFK Airport with Ethel Minor, presented the report. It was published in all the African newspapers and magazines, and we were out. I'm not going to talk about the Panther Party after July 4th. I don't have time. I don't have interest. We were gone. Life begins at conception. I'm sure some of you here might have a problem with that notion. It's okay. We can discuss it. Human life begins with conception. It's a fact. The Panther Party began with conception. The moment it was conceived, it was planned, it was thought out. The Panther Party was conceived June 10, 1964 at a meeting of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It was in the middle of the Mississippi Summer Project, 64. Africans were fighting for the right to vote and for the right to join the Democratic Party. Fannie Lou Hamer led the delegation to the Democratic National Convention, and when she spoke, Lyndon Baines Johnson called an emergency press conference because he didn't want that ignorant, illiterate woman on television. Lyndon Baines Johnson lost Mississippi. 300,000 white folks voted Republicans for Goldwater, 80,000 voted for LBJ, and half of them were African. The numbers might be off because I'm doing it from memory. That's the background. In the middle of this war, SNCC staff are having discussions about what we're going to do next year. You in June of 64 talking about the Black Belt Project of 65. You're talking about what your objectives were in 64 and how you might change it and what the conditions are. You're looking at the mistakes you made and you're looking at the future. One example is that 1,000 white students came from the north to the south to help register people to vote. And that infuriated the right-wing white folk in the South. You fought to get into the Democratic Party, it got sabotaged, it got delayed. Build your own independent political party. The objective of the Black Belt 65 Project was to move 1,000 black students into 30 Black Belt counties in Alabama. They started out with 650 counties from Virginia to Texas. That got sabotaged by the agents of the Democratic Party and the other people inside the staff. The compromise was one state, 30 counties. That became the Black Belt Summer Project. 
That decision was agreed to in the SNCC staff meeting in February at Atlanta University. Kwame Ture with a tank of gas, $100, a sleeping bag, and one contact name was sent into Alabama. He heard that Malcolm X was killed while he was on the road. He called the SNCC office and said, I want to go to the funeral. SNCC told him, no, keep rolling to Alabama. Letter number one is the struggle to build an independent black political party in Alabama. From February of 65 to November 66. Letter number two, that was just Alabama and the South. The Alabama state director, you know, Strickland, so he heard. February of 1965, Kwame made a statement saying he was going north to recruit the biggest, baddest, ugliest, blackest niggas in the ghetto <laughs> with guns to come to Alabama to fight the Klan because the Klan was terrorizing people, the Klan was killing people. So from May of 65, there was a nationwide tour to recruit volunteers, to raise money, to raise support. The Chicago Police Department discovered a leaflet in June of 66, saying the Black Panther is coming <laughs> for two years before Fred Hampton came. There was a network, and I can tell you the names we're doing the research. That was litter number two. Basically, the SNCC support movement in the North, who was supporting the struggle in the South, but then said, when we go back to Chicago, when we go back, we want to build a Black Panther Party there. There were seven attempts to build a Black Panther Party in Chicago before it happened. Too long to discuss why. One of the persons who would have been the leader of the Black Panther Party before Fred Hampton was Yari Amir, who was a gangster disciple gang. So you had a network of Panther parties and chapters, and here we wasn't even known. Black Maoists. The Progressive Labor Party with Bill Epton, you know, Ep uh, Queen Mother Moore. They sent Kwame a letter asking permission to build a Black Panther Party in New York. And there was a meeting in July of 66 where they founded the Panther Party in New York at the Slave Theater with Queen Mother Moore, who goes back to the Garvey days and back to the Stalinist Communist Party. She has a history. And they founded, and 250 people joined. That's the first letter in New York. It was destroyed by December. But they were the Black Maoists. You think it's accident that Huey Newton got a red book to sell? You ever ask the question how a red book get to Oakland, California? That's letter number three. Huey and the forces that you know are letter number four. October 15th, or Bobby now saying 22nd, too long to discuss that. Whenever they were founded, Huey goes to jail. By February of 1968, depending on whose figures you use, there's 15 or 50 of them. Remember the one in New York had 250 members join in one meeting. The meeting down there had 900. The Nation of Islam is what we want, what we believe. Depending on the back of every newspaper, September 22nd, Kwame writes an article for New York Review, and it's called What We Want. <laughs> October 15th, the Panther Party writes one called What We Want and What We Believe. And if you put the three documents side by side, you can do a content analysis and see what was changed, what was taken out, what was added, and make a qualitative analysis. Don't tell me about no 10-point program. I haven't seen thousands of programs. <laughs> Not of implemented, or for whatever reasons not possible to implement them. But there's a history to it. That's litter number three. 
Kwame Ture went on a world tour from June to December of 67. He met Fidel Castro, he met Ho Chi Minh, he met the Algerians, the Syrians, the Sudanese, the Lebanese. He went into Guinea with Secretary Ray. He met Mary McCabe, Mrs. Du Bois, Madame Du Bois. He went into Tanzania. He was the first black panther traveling worldwide. He was a member of so many organizations, so many. He founded Black Panther chapters independent of Hewitt, the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azaneas, Guerrillas, David and Elizabeth Sebeko in the guerrilla camps in Tanzania. Did the first demonstration to free Hewitt outside of U.S. borders. In London, O.B. Igbono Sr. built the Black Panther of London, independent of Oakland. That fifth litter was a bunch of parties and groups worldwide. Black Panther Party of Israel, Black Panther Party of Australia, Black Panther Party of Trinidad. We just don't have time right now, and I got to wrap up and stop. Those are the litters, and we can get down to the kittens. <laughs> David Brothers up there in New York, Seko, Seko Neblet in, in Boston, uh, Coco Farrow and Helen and Ethel and Jan and Paul and Evelyn down there in D.C. I forget his name in, in Richmond, Cleve in Greensboro, Macasa Willie Ricks in Atlanta, Bob Brown in Chicago. We got names. We got names. Finally, we resigned. We have said nothing negative, and we're not denouncing them now. Don't take it that way. We're just giving you, as best we can, in this condition and time and space, a different story. You don't have to agree with it. You don't know nothing about it, so you can't say it's wrong. Do some research. Don't play me. It wasn't that if you ain't read. You still can talk. <laughs> But you're supposed to be training to be scholars and practitioners. Be serious. There was serious ideological, organizational, programmatic, strategic differences on how you help black power for black people in the United States. And then you have the opportunity to travel worldwide and you meet other Africans in other areas of the world. You meet other international forces. So how do you move from an ugly Afro-American into a true Pan-Africanist, a true internationalist? Things changed very quickly, very quickly. And it has taken us 50 years to try to figure out what we did, what we didn't do then, we come to rewrite history. We've been whited out. We're blacking ourselves back in, and we ain't asking permission. We ain't asking permission. You are students. If you were interested in the Panther Party, then even as a hobby, you should do some serious, serious, serious research on that Panther Party. Because you might find out what you can do and use today, and you might find out what you don't need to regurgitate, to reuse. That's our presentation. Thank you. <laughs>